Good morning and welcome to St. Paul downtown Dallas. We have you tuned in on the right day, the right time. We're going to have a dynamic worship experience planned for you today, so stay with us. I promise you, if you stay tuned, you'll be blessed and experience the power of God. During service today, we will have communion, so take some time to electric slide into the kitchen and get you some bread or crackers, water or juice so that you can partake in the sacraments with us. If you're not a part of the St. Paul family, I want to give you the biggest virtual hug to welcome you. You and our online experience, it is going to be powerful. St. Paul, you know what to do. Engage in the chat and with one another and our special guests. Let them know how much we appreciate them for visiting with us online. Now remember, to like, share, subscribe, and engage. And we'll see you in the comments. So praise the Lord, everybody. Everybody, let's praise the Lord. Good morning, St. Paul, and a special hello to our guests and friends. Here's news and information you can use for this week that can help you get connected and grow right here at St. Paul. Galatians Accepted and Free is the current women's Bible study led by Shantara McBride, and it is all of that. Why don't you join us and bring a friend? We're on Zoom each Sunday at 9.15 a.m. Laity Sunday is Sunday, October the 18th, and we are excited to announce that our own Shantara McBride is our speaker for this important day in the life of our church. Please plan to worship with us and to invite friends and family to our virtual worship experience as we are challenged to therefore go with hope. That's Sunday, October the 18th at 10.45 a.m. on the St. Paul YouTube channel. Join us for our church-wide prayer meeting on Zoom hosted by our prayer ministry. The entire congregation is asked to participate in this very important and necessary time of prayer as we focus on gathering up the fragments Thursday, October 15th at 7 p.m. The Zoom link will be available on the website. The Social Justice and Impact Ministry of St. Paul want to encourage everyone to vote and to engage others in the process. Please visit the church's Facebook page or website as we have compiled some important dates for you and your family for the November 3rd elections. To learn more about the happenings of St. Paul, please visit our website at www.spumcd.com. Thank you for your attention and have a blessed week. want to invite you now to worship the Lord in the giving of our gifts. You know, when we give to God, it is how we worship. 
When you go to work every day and at the end of that week or two weeks you get a paycheck, that represents you. It represents your time and your energy, your blood, sweat, and tears. Well, guess what? None of that is possible without the Lord. And even if you're not working right now, that's all right. We're going to pray for you and, and pray that God will cover you and keep you. But we invite you as you are able to participate in worshiping the Lord and honoring God first in our giving. God loves cheerful, generous givers. And we appreciate how you support the ministry here at St. Paul that helps us do meaningful ministry in God's world. We have five ways to give. And I'm going to lift up one of those ways is by Cash App. It is easy and it's convenient. You can use our handle, dollar sign, S-P-U-M-C-D, all caps, and share what the Lord has blessed you with. Let us approach the throne of grace. Please bow with me. 
Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, our Creator and our Redeemer, we come in the living and the loving in the mighty name of Jesus the Christ, thanking you for this day and all the many blessings of the day. We pray, Lord, that you be with us throughout this day and as we worship you in spirit and in truth, that your presence be known and may your Holy Spirit abide in each and every one of us as we recognize who you are and who we belong to. As Lord, you be with our preacher this morning as the word is brought forth and pray that lives will be transformed and enriched as they receive the gift that you've placed in our hands. As Lord, you use us as instruments of peace, hope, love, and joy today and throughout the days ahead. As you continue blessings on those who are sick, those who are shut in, those who are disenfranchised, those who are disabled and really need a loving, healing hand from you. We thank you, Lord, for all those who committed their lives to their needs and pray that you continue to undergird their ministries and all the things that they've been called to do. And may everything that we do be done to your glory and to your glory only. As Lord, you continue to comfort on those who are sick, comfort on those who have lost loved ones, comfort those who are in need away their tears and wipe away anything that keeps them from understanding that you are indeed the God of all gods and the King of all kings and the master and maker of everything. We ask these and receive these in the mighty and loving and loving name of Jesus the Christ. As we give you thanks. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Judges. Judges, the fourth chapter, verses 17 through verse 22. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, come right in. Don't be afraid. So he entered her tent, and she covered him with a blanket. I'm thirsty, he said. Give me some water. She opened a skin of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone in there, say no. But Jael, Huber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through his temple into the ground, and he died. Just then, Barak came by in pursuit of Sisera. And Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I will show you the man you're looking for. So he went in with her, and there lay Sisera with the tent peg through his temple, dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, let's go to God in prayer as we prepare to go through God's word today. Holy God, we thank you so much. You have guided us all week. You've guarded us all week. You've been kind and faithful all week long. And so today we take a moment just to pause and acknowledge your presence in our lives, to acknowledge your greatness and your goodness, and God, to come before your throne of grace and mercy that we might receive encouragement, that we might receive strength, that we might receive power, that we might receive direction, that we might receive peace. God, we ask now that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts and our minds. Would you transform us? Would you conform us more to the image of your Son? God, speak peace and life and hope to your people this day, and we will continue to give you all the glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name, amen. Friends, I want to invite you this morning to think with me with this theme in mind. Do what you got to do. Do what you got to do. I will never forget, friends, an incident that happened to me when I was in the third grade. There was a fight that broke out on the playground, and I, like the other children, rushed uh, to form a circle around this boy and this girl that were fighting, something that my parents told me never to do. And so in all of the excitement and the, and the kids in the circle pushing each other around to get a good view, I got pushed into the guy that was fighting. Mm -hmm. 
And so what happened was he stopped fighting the girl in front of him and he turned around and turned on me. And all of a sudden, the fight that I was watching became the fight that I was in. Amen, somebody. Now, I didn't want to fight. I wasn't looking for a fight. I didn't even know how to fight. But I found myself, nevertheless, in a fight. So I did what I had to do. I did what any third grade girl would do in that situation. I closed my eyes and I started swinging. Amen, somebody. <laughs> you know, sometimes life is like that, right? Sometimes you're not looking for a fight. You don't want to fight. And maybe like me, you don't even know how to fight. But nonetheless, the fight comes to your life. Uh -huh. And you find yourself fighting for your children. You may find yourself fighting for your relationship, fighting for your sanity, fighting for your education, fighting for your relationship, fighting for your community. You didn't plan on a fight, but sometimes, friends, you got to do what you got to do. Hmm? I want to recommend to you that sometimes, like me, you just got to come out swinging. Hmm? Because, friends, there are times when we simply must learn to fight back. You know, 1 Peter 5 is a familiar text. We've been talking about it a little bit. It says, discipline yourself. Keep alert like a roaring lion. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour, looking for a fight, looking to mess with you. Our adversary is always trying to start some mess in our lives to wreak havoc in our lives. But that verse in 1 Peter 5 goes on to say, resist him steadfast in your faith. That means, friends, we actively oppose the work of the enemy. We are to actively stand against evil and injustice and oppression. As a matter of fact, as United Methodists, that is in our baptismal vows. We are asked if we accept the freedom and the power that God gives us to resist evil and injustice and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. Even if they present themselves in the form of white supremacy and even if the president won't denounce it, we will stand against it, we will resist it, and we will fight back. Friends, we must take a stand. We must discipline ourselves for the battle ahead. We must do what we got to do. Today, we continue in our sermon series, In Transit, making it through seasons of challenge and change. And we've been taking a look at the lives of biblical characters and how they dealt with days and sometimes seasons of difficulties. We've been looking at how they handled the fight when it came to their lives. We began with Job and how even in all of his suffering, he continued to trust God. Then we took a look at the bent over woman that we call Sheila. Hmm? She was bent but not broken and she endured and she persisted and she would not give up until she found a solution to her problem. Last week we heard about Daniel's story and how even in exile he excelled and he maintained his hope and he persevered in prayer because he stood in hope in a hellish place. Friends, today we're going to take a look at another story. Today we're going to talk about J.L.'s story, who is, which is found in Judges chapter 4. J.L. has come to be known in Israel's history as a warrior. She's come to be known as a fighter, as one who confronted the enemy head on and experienced victory. J.L. did what she had to do and she came through it victorious. Now, friends, J.L.'s story is connected to the story of Deborah and Barak. So we're going to look at some of their story for context. Judges 4.1 says, The Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. Ehud was a judge, one of the 15 judges that ruled in Israel. So the Lord sold them into the hand of King Jabin of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera. 
You see, God's people here are in trouble because of their disobedience to God, because of their sin. And friends, you know, sin has consequences. As quiet as it's kept, as much as we don't like to toss around the S word, uh -huh, uh -huh, sin, friends, always has a price tag. And we don't understand sometimes that sin has a communal effect, huh? That sometimes even though uh, maybe someone or, or several persons have done nothing wrong, uh, we experience evil as a result of living in a world that is broken by sin. Sin's consequences affect innocent people because sin has a communal effect. And so God's people here are in trouble. God's people have messed up. But the good news is that even though God's people have messed up, God still cares for God's people and God was still committed to their deliverance. Verse three says that the people cried out to God for help and God responded. I'm so glad we serve a God who responds to our cries. I'm so glad we serve a God who even when we mess up, even when we are in trouble, even when we bring it on ourselves, God responds to our cries and has mercy on us. Psalm 120 verse one says, I call on the Lord in my distress and he answers me. So we find here in this text that De Deborah, who was judging Israel at the time, summons Barak, who is Israel's commander, and she tells him that God is saying it's time to fight back. God is telling him to raise up an army. It is God who tells the people to fight back. It is God who tells the people to do what they got to do. Uh -huh. He says, you tell Sisera to meet you by the water. I got something for him. Amen, somebody. He says, I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the Wadi Kishon, and I will give him into your hand. I like that the God who calls him to fight is the God who assures him of God's presence because God was committed to deliver God's people then. And let me give you some really good news. God is committed to our deliverance right here and right now. But friends, we must be active participants in our own deliverance. I have a good friend's friend that says, God will give you a toothbrush, but God won't brush your teeth for you. Amen, somebody. You must be an active participant in your own deliverance. God tells God's people, do what you got to do, fight back. And yet Barak is hesitant to go into battle. He tells Deborah he won't go without her. And Deborah responds in verse 9 and she says, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. So they go and they round up the army. And then verse 11 gives us what I like to call a sidebar. It seems like it's not related, but, but it means something later. Uh, verse 11 says, now Haber the Kenite had separated from the other Kenites. That is the descendants of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses. He had moved away uh, from the other, from God's people and had moved closer. He got close with the enemy. Now this seems like an irrelevant insertion, but I promise you it'll mean something later on. Hmm? So Barak rounds up the army and the fight is on. And verse 15 says that the Lord threw Sisera and all his army into a panic before Barak. I like that. It reminds us that if God calls you to fight, then God will be with you in the fight. God is in the fight with God's people. God is in the good fight of faith. God is in the fight for righteousness and justice and truth. So Barak's army defeats Sisera and Sisera escapes and he's on the run. And that brings us to our passage for this morning. Verse 17, now Sisera had fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, wife of Heber the Kenite. Aha, uh -huh, the one we talked about just a little while ago. For there was peace between King Jabin of Hazor and the clan of Haber the Kenite. Uh -huh. So Jael's husband was cozy with the enemy. Uh -huh. Jael uh, uh, may not realize that she has been sleeping with the enemy. Amen, somebody. Sometimes you don't realize who you connected with. And so Sisera runs to Jael's tent because of his relationship with her husband, Haber. 
Remember now, uh, he has separated from God's people. He's become friendly. Her husband became friendly with Israel's enemies. Uh -huh. And so, so the enemy, Sisera, feels comfortable uh -huh, going to her home. Uh -huh. That's why you have to be careful who you connect with. Uh -huh, because sometimes you can invite the enemy into your house. Uh -huh. See, friends, sometimes the fight is in your backyard. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the fight comes to your front door. Sometimes the, the fight is in your own family. It's in your, your, at your own job. Uh -huh. it's, it's, in your, it's in your own relationship. Uh -huh. It's your problem. Uh -huh. See, the enemy knows just where to attack us. And it's difficult and it's hard when the fight hits close to home. And we have to develop a spiritual backbone. We have to develop some spiritual strength, some spiritual tenacity, some spiritual nerve, some spiritual audacity, some spiritual maturity, so we know how to fight back. And so we find Jael here caught between a rock and a hard place. If she helps Sisera, she makes Israel her enemy. Mm -hmm. But if she refuses to help Sisera, he may harm her. Uh -huh. See, I told you, you don't always get to pick your fight. Uh -huh. It's a mess. And it's a mess JL didn't ask for, didn't create, and doesn't deserve. But trouble has come to her door. And sometimes, friends, whether we deserve it or not, trouble will find its way to our front door. But verse 18 says something I find very powerful. It says, Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, turn aside, my Lord, turn aside to me, have no fear. She invites the enemy into her tent. Uh-huh. She invites him in. Why does she do this? I believe that when you do what you gotta do, you don't run from the difficult situation. You confront it. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. That's the first thing we have to do is confront the situation. We cannot afford to be afraid of the enemy's mess. We cannot afford to be afraid of trouble. Don't run from it. Don't ignore it. Don't deny it. Deal with it. Sometimes we have to make an upfront decision that this mess cannot stay in my house. Uh -huh. This mess will not, be, will, I will not tolerate this mess in my home. This confusion will not camp out where I live. This evil will not dwell in my presence. Uh, you must believe, we must believe that God will give us what we need to confront the schemes of the enemy. So JL comes out boldly and invites Sisera. She said, come on, come on in this house. Come on in this camp. Come on and let me, come on, come on, let me, let's work it out. Come on in here. Uh -huh. And he runs into her tent and the text says she covers him with a rug and then he asks her for water. And the Bible says she opened a skin of milk and he gave him a drink and covered him. She, she's acting like his mama, huh? Uh, what's, what's going on? She acts acting like she cares about him, uh-huh, uh-huh. And what her behavior tells me is that when you're in a battle, when you're in a fight, when the enemy is up in your camp, it is not the time to lose your cool, uh-huh. Don't lose control, don't panic, uh-huh. What you need is a plan, mm -hmm. a strategy. And Jael has a plan. She appears to be helpless in this situation, but she's being strategic and she's working her plan, huh? And when you do what you gotta do, you gotta work what you got. Amen, somebody. And friends, we must ask the Lord for wisdom to maneuver strategically when confronting the schemes of the enemy. Proverbs 2.10 2, says, when wisdom comes into your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, discretion will preserve you, understanding will keep you to deliver you from the way of evil. Don't underestimate your ability to handle the difficult situations that come your way. The Bible declares that God has given us everything we need pertaining to life and godliness. We, we must learn just how to work what we have. Notice that Sisera asked for water, but Jael gives him milk. You see, some goat's milk was known to cause drowsiness. I told you, the sister has a plan. She keeps her cool and works her plan. Somebody needs to hear that word this morning. You need to keep your cool and work your plan. Amen, somebody. 
Verse 20, Sisera then says to her, stand at the entrance of the tent. And if anybody comes and asks you, is anyone here? Say no. Does it ever seem as though the enemy is just taking over? See, now, now he's in her tent trying to tell her what to do. Huh? See, see, now the enemy is just out of control. Uh -huh. And friends, that's when it's time to do what you got to do. That's when it's time to make your move. You've been praying long enough. It's time to make your move. You've been waiting on the Lord long enough. It's time for you to act. You have fasted and prayed. So make your move because faith without works, without action, is dead. And see, sometimes, friends, you got to be willing to do what JL did, and that is take a calculated risk. Uh huh. Take a calculated risk. A calculated risk is a risk taken with a chance of failure, the probability of which is estimated before some action is taken. Uh huh. It, you know it's a risk, and, and so you count the cost. Uh huh. But you do it anyway. Amen, somebody. Uh huh. You, when you take a calculated risk, you know it might fail. You know it could blow up in your face. Uh huh. Uh huh. But you you looked at it. And you've decided to go for it because that's what happens when you do what you got to do. You risk it anyhow. And God is calling us to be spiritual risk takers. God is calling us to dare to get involved, to dare to make a difference, to dare to speak up, to dare to challenge the status quo, to dare to confront the evil and chaos in our world. JL takes a calculated risk. She makes a decision. She chooses to align herself with Israel, with God's people. And alignment with Israel, alignment with God's people is alignment with God. Uh -huh. And see, now she has positioned herself. Uh -huh. uh, now, now she is in place and, and now she's positioned herself where she may experience God's presence and God's power and God's purpose and God's strength. So verse 21 says, J.L., the wife of Haber took a tent peg and a hammer. Amen, somebody. She took it in her hand. She went softly to him and drove the tent peg into his temple and he died. And she took out the enemy in her home. I told you, sometimes you, you got to do what you got to do. Now hear me well. I'm not advocating violence. I'm just saying, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. And I must admit, as I thought about this text, I wondered, why did she get a tent peg and a hammer? Why not just drop a rock or pick up a knife and just have at it, huh? But, but she picked up a tent peg and a hammer. And I learned something. You see, it was the responsibility of the women to pitch the tents, uh-huh. It, it was their job to take the tent peg and the hammer and pitch the tent. And when you use something on a regular basis, then you know how to use it. I told you, you gotta work what you got, but you gotta know how to, to use what you got. You gotta know how to work what you got so it works in your favor. This was not the time for a weapon that she didn't know how to use. She defeated her enemy with a weapon she was familiar with. Uh huh. And friends, we have some weapons uh, that we need to be familiar with. And the Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, are not human, they are not fleshly, but they have divine power to tear down strongholds. Uh huh. Your prayer is your weapon. Your praise is your weapon. Your worship is your weapon. Your word, your time in God's word is your weapon. And friends, you got to work what you got. You got to know how to use the weapons uh, of your warfare. See, see it's not time uh, to pull out, now I lay me down to sleep when, when the enemy is in your camp. You got to know how to pray and know how to fast and know how to discern what thus says the Lord. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, that they're not of human origin. Uh -huh, they're not human, but they are mighty in God. And if we would just get more familiar with our weapons, uh -huh, more familiar with prayer, uh -huh, more disciplined in, in our study, uh -huh, uh -huh, more time in God's presence, when the attack comes, we will be able to do whatever we have to do. We're not scrambling, we're not confused, and we ain't scared. Huh? Because you know how to labor in prayer. You know how to lay on your face before the Lord. You know how to overcome with the word of your testimony. 
Friends, for this season, for this level of evil, for such a time as this, we need to know what it means to operate in God's power and God's anointing and God's authority uh, with faith and with discipline so that we can contend with spiritual wickedness in high places. J.L. wielded weapons that she knew how to use and she defeated the enemy that had come into her home and aligned herself with the people of God. Then as Barak came in pursuit of Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said to him, like Olivia Pope, it's Handel. <laughs> it's already taken care of. Uh -huh. the, the one that you seek, I've already laid him out. Uh -huh. And on that day, the Bible says, God subdued King Jabin of Canaan. On that day, God handled it. She was the instrument that God used to take the enemy out. Uh, God wants to use us to defeat the schemes of the enemy in our lives and in this world. And friends, we need to remember that the battle is not ours, it's the Lord's. Hmm? But we have to position ourselves for God to use us. In the Song of Deborah and Judges 5, Jael is celebrated as a warrior, the most blessed of tent-dwelling women, because she did what she had to do. You know, one of, my, one of my favorite movies is a movie called Just Right. And in this movie, Queen Latifah plays a physical therapist named Leslie Wright. And, and she ends up acting as a trainer for a basketball player named Scott, Man, Scott McKnight, who's played by Common. Uh-huh, yeah, Common. Amen, somebody. And, and so one of my favorite scenes in the movie is the first game he plays after she has nursed, him, nursed his injured knee back to health. It's a critical playoff game, uh -huh, but it's not going well. Uh -huh. He's not playing very well. He's playing very timid and very afraid. And so in frustration, he sits down on the bench and hangs his head in despair. And, and, and Leslie gets up and she comes and she gets in his ear and she says, you are acting like you believe this knee is going to fail you. She said it won't. She said anything you want to do, uh -huh, anything you need to do, you can do. Believe in yourself and let's go to work. Friends, I just came by here this morning to be your spiritual trainer. I just came by here this morning to get in your ear and say you're acting like you believe your God is going to fail you. I'm telling you that God wants um, anything you need to do, um, anything you want to do, uh, anything God has called you to do, you can do it. Believe in yourself. Um, believe in the God who lives in you. Believe in Christ who is in you, the hope of glory. Believe in the Holy Spirit, your teacher and counselor and advocate and friend. And let's go to work. We've got a fight to fight. We've got a God to glorify. You can do whatever you got to do by the power of God's spirit. Somebody here today needs to do like I did in the third grade and start swinging. Start fighting for your children. Fighting for your family. Fighting for your community. Fighting for your church. Fighting for your sanity. Fighting for the will of God in this world. Anything we need to do, anything God has called us to do, we can do it. We have to believe in the God who lives and reigns and rules and lives in us. Do what you got to do. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Friends, today, maybe it's hard for you to do what you need to do because you feel like you're all by yourself. I want to tell you that you're not, that there is, uh, you have a friend whose name is Jesus who is longing to, to strengthen you and to bless you and to be a part of your life. And so we want to introduce you to this Jesus who gives us what we need to, to overcome the problems and the challenges in this world. Perhaps you do know Jesus, but you've just been kind of out there by yourself. We'd like you to come and connect with us in these seasons of challenge and change and walk together so that we accomplish uh, God's purpose in our lives, in our community, and in our world. We'd love to connect with you.
Maybe you need a church home. We, we invite you to think about being a part of St. Paul. Whatever your need is today, would you go to spumcd.com and connect with us? And we invite you to do that. Pray about it. Consider it. Consider how God wants to use you for such a time as this. God bless you. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. You have, friends this morning, an invitation from the Lord. And so, as I pray this prayer of repentance, would you take a moment in your own home, in your own heart, to confess your sins before the Lord. Holy God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have rebelled against your love. We've not kept your law. We've not loved one another. We've not heard the cry of the needy. Lord God, would you forgive us and would you free us for joyful obedience to your word, to your will, and to your way. Friends, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Now, would you pray with me as we bless these elements and bless the elements that you have in your home, in your hands. Holy God, we give you thanks and praise for these gifts that you have given us of bread and wine. We ask you to pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts, on the gifts that the people are holding now in their hands at home. Would you make them be for us, the body and blood of Christ, so that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your precious Holy Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with every believer, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Friends, on the night that Jesus offered himself up for us all, he took bread, he blessed it, and he broke it. And he said, take and eat. This is my body that is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, then he took the cup and he gave thanks to God. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant that is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Friends, would you receive now those elements that you have in your hands? The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ that is shed for you. We give God glory. We give God honor. And we give God thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for tuning in and worshiping with us today. We pray that the word blessed you. I know it blessed me. We will see you next week. So take care and be blessed.